Welcome to This Commerce Life. We are an unscripted podcast dedicated to small businesses and entrepreneurs in the retail and consumer packaged goods space in Canada and the United States. I am Phil Chang, co-host and co-founder. And I'm Kenny Benucci, co-host and co-founder of This Commerce Life. Our love is the journey to retail and our passion is sharing that with you every week. must have a genie in a bottle because you just you know if you have three wishes you said geez i wonder what phil is and then phil appeared so i think you've only got two wishes left so i, I think that's no, okay no no do you know how many of those wishes there are james like it, <laughs> there are a lot of those <laughs> maybe it's, maybe they're unlimited i don't know i've never i've never had a genie. <laughs> who knows who knows uh, we'll yeah. see we'll see who knows um it's nice to meet you yeah nice to meet you too phil I, i've heard your name but i i um we've never met so it's well, I only of... met him the one time just a couple weeks ago, no. when, or whatever the That's hell right. it was. That was That's, the first yeah, time. With the, yeah. yeah. Your cohort, I know. Yes, uh, my partner in crime. Yes, your partner in crime mm-hmm. there, I know. Mm-hmm. Whatever yeah. her name is, yeah. Whatever that one's <laughs> name is. <laughs> and then the minions below her that I don't like either. Uh, I don't like any of that crew. They're all mean to me. Make uh, me do shit that I don't like doing. No, no, I like Sumner's good. <laughs> Sumner and I have an agreement. Thunder's she needs awesome. Kenny to do something. She calls me. I just, exactly. I have unlimited oh, wishes there. So yeah, yeah. And if Elisa calls, like she, I, she asked me to to talk to um, uh, I guess some some young person who just signed up with you guys. So uh, like I can't say no. So of course I'm going to do it. So <laughs> whatever. And she's, and she's counting on that. <laughs> I did already. I had the phone call today. Oh, oh did you? Um, oh, that's yeah. Good. That's really good. nice, nice young woman. The, Afghani woman who's trying to do some cool things. Yeah, really, really the, sweet. Just, I really liked her. It was, it's, it's incredible. It was funny actually. I, I had an, I was interviewed for Western Food Processor magazine, and, and he, you know, we we're talking a little bit about the economy and kind of, you know, because we're, we're hearing a little bit more gloom and doom than than we have in quite a while. And, yeah, and uh, yeah, and, and they were talking about, you know, geez, are you not seeing any more new companies entering the space? And I'm like. Well, no, because I mean, the cost of entry to actually getting involved, getting started in this industry is really low, right? You know, there's not a lot of barriers to entry. If you have a recipe and a place to make your product and yep, you get come to up go. with a brand name and a label, you, you can get started, right? So I said, well, no, we're not seeing it slow down. I said, how long those companies last or, you know, have decide that they don't have the stomach for it. That's a completely different, uh, that's a completely different topic. But anyway. And that's happening, right? Because you are, you, you know, it, it. we were talking about the Saturday, Phil and I, you got all the... All the government um, grants and stuff are going to be coming due pretty quick. There's yeah. some uh, BDC that are already happening. You know, you signed when the interest rates were zip. You know, at COVID, now they're you know getting close to eight nine percent on some of these paybacks. Like it's not, it's not easy. No, like, it's, it's not. not. And you know, and and that's and that's the problem though, right? With with processors, is they kind of get squeezed in the middle because they got all these you know all these all these costs are coming one way and then their ability yeah. to pass them on. And sometimes it's not even just dealing with retailers on passing on their costs. It's, it's the fact that they, it's been such a continuous increase. It's even catching up to it. You know, if you, you know, if you look at your prices and think, geez, I've got to mark everything up 20% and it takes you six months to get that implemented on, you know, into your, into your, your pricing It's well, probably gone exactly. up another 15 since then. Right. Yeah. So it's been like running up a down escalator for the last two years for people. So. It's just, it's out of control and, and there's been no, I mean, it has slowed down. It's been a lot less offensive lately than it's been, but then yeah. there's other issues. Like there always seems to be something, something smacking us right now. Right. Since COVID it's, we haven't yeah. had really a break. It's one thing or another, but you know well, what? And that's, yeah, that's the problem, right? Everyone kind of made it through COVID and I think everyone was expecting, uh, you know, rainbows and sunshine and it's just been kind of, <laughs> now we're paying for all the, you know, all the the SIBA loans and a lot of those other things too. So I mean, some of the inflationary stuff. I think I think most of us saw it coming, but you know, it's just the the rate at which it's coming and the fact that it's not leveling off or it, it's leveling off a bit now, but it's leveling off at such a high point though. It's uh, exactly you know, how sustainable is yeah. it? Right? Yeah, exactly. And what's leveling off? Some is leveling off, then others pick up, and then those <laughs> slow down. The other side picks up. It just seems to go back and forth. And yet, you know yeah. what? People are still battling through. You know, we still talk to people who are doing really cool things and. You know, organizations like yours or CHFA yeah. who are helping behind it. I mean, really, at the end of the day, it's at least you have some support out there. There's, I mean, we'll talk more about this in a minute, but at least there's yeah. places for people to get some help, some guidance, right? 
Yeah, and it's just really kind of in in up there's a, you know groups like ours who are you know in CHFA like you mentioned you know if we're if we're doing our job when we're staying on top of it I mean our what we're supposed to be doing is adapting and changing when our you know when when industries needs change so it's exactly it's been, it's been, it's been five years of that now. So. But that's what I think. There's no it doesn't seem to be getting a break. Like you're looking for a time where okay maybe yeah. just for the next little bit just status quo we'll just maintain. You don't get yeah. the maintain part. It's just always something coming at us, right? Uh, very true very true so they'd be bored to tears death, otherwise that's why so. a thousand cuts yeah i'd run we'll yeah, run out of stuff to do otherwise yeah exactly plus what we would complain about yeah <laughs> that's right, right? not gonna complain about the weather we haven't seen rain in months like we're actually kind of like well getting a little bit dry but yeah yeah no kidding i know i've been watching the u.s feed seeing all the complaining about all the canadian smoke that's crossing the border so shit this and we haven't started I know, I know. Like we're only, we're not even a mid June yet. Mid June kind of, yet. Kind of so, scary. I know it's wild. So, so it's, getting it's closer funny. to home too. I saw some, in, you know, in, uh, in uh, near Chilliwack. Now there's some fires. Harrison, they today. were saying, yeah, Harrison. Well, it's Harrison, time. but this morning was Chilliwack. So oh, was it Chilliwack? Close. Jeez. Yeah. Well, yeah. For fun. for us too, like so for Torontonians, forest fires isn't a thing, right? Like <laughs> no. so, I I know because like usually every year I'm out to see Kenny, and then and then in the summer when I come out. There's it's usually smoke some sort of haze, right? So you get used to it. And um, we're, we're like, I'm in solidly in Toronto, like in Mississauga near the airport. And right. we've had three or four days of it now. Like they've, um, today was the first day that they told kids to, like they're canceling all the outdoor activities. They're bringing them all inside and leaving them inside. And everyone's yeah. like, wow, what's this thing? And I was like, actually, I didn't really think about it because when I go out West to see you guys, usually in the summer, there's, a whole bunch of days where there's some haze in the city somewhere right and so you oh, kind yeah. of don't you know uh, but we, we we've never seen it like i think we've got fires burning outside of ottawa now um yeah which is for us that's it's insane pretty surprising it's it's surprising right so yeah 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 for sure yeah, yeah. man um can right, you so, want to do an uh, intro? I, hope, I hope we don't run out of things to talk about guys no, not likely. We can all yap quite oh, a bit. Not likely. Goodness. I'm not. Yeah, that's probably the least of the oh issues. Oh my! I don't think that's the concern. Yeah, and no, I'm not too right about that. <laughs> it's it's yeah. not. Yeah. James, you can light it up in a minute because what we'll do. So we have James Donaldson on today, uh, CEO of CEO, BC yeah. Food and CEO. I didn't know if the CEO president, CEO of BC Food and Beverage. Um, so in BC, that's that's our go-to people. If you're starting up in the food industry on the production, processing, manufacturing side, phenomenal organization, good people at the top, a uh, couple good people in the middle. I'm not going to give Sumner credit yet because, uh, you know, she's getting Sumner, in trouble. I love you. Don't worry about Whatever. it. Whatever. I'm not going to do it. I'll look after him for you. you Whatever. Keep doing what uh, you're a doing. A good group and helpful for people starting up. So, James, for you, I think for Phil and I, what we'd like to know is um, sort of, I guess, where you came from, uh, how you got here or why you got here. Um, I, I'd like to a little more talk around BC Food and Bev, like what it's about, um, what's the goals, yep. what are you finding, and then some insights. What do you think? Like, I mean, we talked a little bit about what we, we sort of high level, what we some of the issues and complaints that just have been three years worth of it. But where do you think the industry is going? What do you think the bright spots are going to be? Where do you think some of the challenges are going to be? Um, but 45 minutes an hour is uh, it's yours, man. All right. Well, uh, sure. I mean, wow, where did it start? Um, well, I was, I was originally from Winnipeg. Um, I moved here in 91. So when I was three years old, obviously, for sure. Uh, <laughs> no. Um, yeah, I graduated from the university of Manitoba and, uh, and moved here. It was funny. I kind of moved here on a bit of a whim. My sister moved here and was trying to talk me into it. And I didn't, I didn't know what to do in Winnipeg. There was not a lot of career aspirations for me. So I thought I'd come out here and give it a whirl. And actually I had a job with BC hydro as a financial analyst. Doesn't that yeah, sound exciting? That sounds exciting. Yeah. Rip roaring. Yeah. <laughs> And and then I got a letter in the mail because of course those were the pre-internet days that uh, they put on a hiring freeze and my job no longer existed. This was like six weeks before I graduated from university, and I went well now what do I do? And I kind of went you know what screw it I'll just go out there and give it a roll and see. And like I said that was that was what thirty thirty two and a half years ago. So uh, so I, I I found something <laughs> I, I hit my groove somewhere. <laughs> so what did you do after that? Like what was yeah, the what was the <laughs> Well, I, uh, I, uh, you know, it's funny when you graduate with an arts degree, uh, you're, you're not really qualified to do a lot. So, <laughs> so, um, yeah, I actually, my first job when I moved here, I was selling fax machines. You remember those? 
Yeah, I remember those. They know, and they don't yeah, use those either. I, I'm too young for that. I have no idea what that is. Yeah, whatever. Oh, <laughs> oh damn you, Phil. Yeah. He's a liar. Don't listen yeah. to him. That's, that's bullshit. I know. I know that's he knows bullshit. what they are. I know. I've, I've got young people in the office, and they, you know, they, they yeah, like, yeah, they whatever. like to Google it to, to, to see. I know it hurts mm -hmm. a little bit, but um, yeah, and I did that on, uh, on on commission actually for about a year and a half, and it was a, a brutal job. It's kind of funny, you know. You, you sort of learn there that yeah, you, sometimes the worst jobs you you learn the best, most important lessons, and you know, overcoming overcoming objections and 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 active listening and that type of thing. It was it was uh, those were actually really important skills to learn. So, um, and I did that for about a year and a half, and. And then actually, that's kind of when I started getting involved in the food industry. I joined uh, Diageo, which is like the world's largest uh, beverage yeah. alcohol Boost. company. And I, I, yeah. yeah, I worked there for five years and got a lot of training and first in sales. And I was kind of doing category management and anal an analysis, that type of thing. Um, yeah. And then it was funny. And it's, ever since then, I've mostly been in the food industry for the last 30 years. And it was kind of never really by design it was never you know it was sort of not, nothing specific that i set out to do i you know thought i'd move out here and pursue my dreams although i had no idea what those were and and somewhere i found my passion which which was the food industry so um yeah and even after diageo i i went to east veggie cuisine and worked there for a couple of years and, okay. and worked under East Hotman and and then i went to uh, bc hothouse um I, I was there for five years and became marketing director and uh, then went on to Maple Leaf and was there for was their marketing director for four years. And then I started consulting for a few years. And then about nine years ago, uh, the board was crazy enough to hire me to take on this job. So that was back in uh, 2014. So uh, so oh, wow. they've, they've been with me for a while now. So that's okay. So you've so you've done a bit of bit of everything. You've done some <clears throat> some marketing, some sales, yeah. and on a few sides of the desk, so to speak, right? Some yeah, and actually, even and even after Maple Leaf, I, I left and uh, and and was uh, was kind of kind of cool. I took over as a GM of a startup, and they were in the freeze dry uh, space, and and I did, didn't have a lot of familiarity with freeze dry, but um, you know, it took me to Asia and learned a lot about uh, doing business there because a lot of the shareholders were based there. And uh, unfortunately, that was in 2008, which is sort of <laughs> not a good time to be a startup no. trying to raise capital in, in 2008, 2009. So unfortunately, that venture only lasted a couple of years. And that's when I kind of slid into uh, consulting, where most of my consulting was actually working. No, so he told me he had to move from his office. His office was even before you got on, he was on and yeah. the Internet was choppy as choppy. So he moved to a, a general space, which apparently doesn't work much better. Well, we got dead air there, Phil. So we do, we do. But interesting, right? Because he, uh, so he he definitely understands the space, right? Like he's, well, he's been he's on all sides of it. It's a marketing yeah. for BC Hot. You know, <clears throat> I was like the Hot House part. I part I find interesting too. I just like all that all that food side. But it's kind of a little bit of everything from packaged goods to, I guess, even more the the growing side. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. That is interesting. I don't know why you? Why would you leave booze though? Like you think that'd be uh, fun? Uh, no, it's kind of it's a tough place to be though, because um, you really why you left booze to go into food. Why did I leave booze to go into food? Yeah, sorry, I lost the connection there for a minute, guys. But it's, no, okay. it's all good. It's all we good. We talk to ourselves. It's all good. We've yeah. done that before. You know, it's funny. That's one of the things about the food industry in BC is that you know a couple of the jobs that I left, I loved, <clears throat> but it's because you know you were working in a regional office and the head office was in Toronto. And uh, when I left Diageo and when I left Maple Leaf, it was because essentially my my job was 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 being restructured, and, I, and they wanted me to move to Toronto. In both cases, and mm -hmm. both cases, no offense, Phil, I uh, I made the decision to st to stay in BC because you know I'd met my wife and we had kids and had grown roots, and we just decided to kind of um, you know stay here, and that was just Climate sort of the decision better. we made. But From, but you I know, it's interesting reality when you, the way when it you're looking I've for those. I've never met a West Coaster who has ever like I've never met anyone from Toronto who has moved to Vancouver and said, I must go back. Right. I, I, I don't, right. Like even me, and I most Winnipeggers, and, we keep all I, the Winnipeggers. Yeah. None of them go back. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Although it's, it's weird though. Winnipeg's, you know, it's funny. Winnipeg gets a hard knock, but I'll tell you what, the people there are so friendly when I, I moved here. I couldn't, for that. I couldn't, I couldn't get over how hard it was to meet people coming when I first came to Vancouver, you know, and like Winnipeg, you, you go start at a job on Monday and, like they're 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 asking you to out for drinks after work. Like yeah, you did a social on on Saturday at night or Friday night. You guys did socials. Like you guys are always out and about. 
That's exactly. Weird. Yeah, and it's just not like that here, but but that's no. okay. I've, it's, no, I but the city's always been like that. The city's not noted for its ultimate friendliness, right? It's just not a easy city to, city to meet people. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, but I came to love it, and uh, and I've stuck it out. So, yeah, but it's uh yeah it's it's been a it's it's certainly been an interesting uh it's certainly been an interesting time, and and it was actually funny when I left. I mentioned that startup that I left. Um, when I left, I was uh, a little surprised, you know, cause the, you know, the, the investors basically said, oh yeah, the money we had, we don't have anymore. <laughs> and, uh, and then, and actually when my, <clears throat> when I was younger, I was, I was a real jock growing up and, and my dream job was to be in the sporting goods industry. And for a time I actually got a job uh, working in the, in the action sports industry. And I thought, oh my God, this is amazing. I'm so excited. And that was when I knew that my heart was in the food industry because I, I didn't and I didn't know that until I left the food industry. Yeah. And I couldn't believe it. You know, you you don't know any of the customers, you don't know any of the other players and you just feel like kind of kind of, you know, kind of naked. You, you just don't know anything about you just don't have a lay of the land and, and no, yeah. no, nothing. In, nothing was instinctive. Yeah. And I was there for a while. But of course, everyone was going through financial hardship there so i worked with them for a while and it just wasn't working and that's when i went into consulting but yeah it was it was really funny and even all, all those years being in the food industry i never thought of myself as being like a food industry person until uh until i wasn't and then i thought holy crap that's where i belong so <laughs> and i haven't left an industry since. it's a good industry like cpg in general is pretty good but when you get yeah. into the food side food's fun like it really is it's, it's good the people are nice people talk they share i don't know it's just I don't know, it's a good vibe yeah, well, and that's a big part of what we've done here too. Like, you know, one of the one of our big sort of things that we try to do is is to build community. And uh, you know, it's it's incredible how many times people will you know reach out to us or join the association and or or, or just reach out to because they don't even know where to go and and you know maybe maybe joining us is one option uh, and just trying to kind of carve out their path. And you know, it's amazing how many of them are are so inclined to figure out you know think that they just have to reinvent the wheel and go through all the same struggles that so many companies before them have 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 done and 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 like not a lot of people are reinventing the wheel here and they're all going to run across the same obstacles they're all going to have the same challenges of trying to scale up they're all going to have struggle with access to capital so right. it's like it doesn't matter whether it's seafood or natural <laughs> health products or or craft beer, you know, like there's their, their, their products and characteristics and maybe their manufacturing processes are going to be different, but all those other things that Very they similar. face, they're all the same. All the so same. we've kind of always tried to go like, like there's 80% 80, 80 the same and there's 20% that makes you unique. So we've always kind of said to people, you focus on the 20% that makes you unique and we can help you with the other 80% because we can't be experts in every single subcategory no. and everything, right? Because yeah. we, we'd have a hundred people and we still wouldn't be able to kind of right. give people the help that they need. So we, we try to, Focus on the stuff that affects everybody. So you left all that to work to do office office things. Like, what was the motivation to go to BC Food and Beverage? Like, because that's different. Now you're in a whole different world, right? You're you're now it's it's a it's it's a different level of consulting. Even to, I guess to some degree, it's a different world than well, it, it is. And and being a nonprofit, like that was <laughs> new to me. That must I, be I, new I too. Spent, yeah, I mean, I spent twenty years in the private sector and always had P and L accountability, and you know, always thinking about those kinds of things and. Um, but but I, I kind of initially, you know, the association was a lot smaller back then, you know, so nine years ago, I, I don't remember exactly what our membership was, but, you know, we had one or two employees and we and we did a lot of government programs and things like that. So um, so when I joined, though, I kind of I saw the opportunity there because I thought, well, I mean, the types of people that are joining the association need help are the same type of people that I had as clients. So I kind of almost saw a lot of synergies between what mm -hmm. I was doing and doing mm -hmm. an association, doing it through the association, but trying to do it on a on, on a bigger way. Um, I had no clue about things like advocacy and some of the other things that the association did. And, and, um, you know, and I, I guess that's probably the first thing that I discovered. I thought, well, all we're doing is offering you know, administering government programs for people, you know, well, one, like, how, you, you know, you don't have to be a member to be leveraging those sort of government programs. So what, what are we offering to our members? Right. All we're giving is government programs. They could do those without joining. So what, what are we, what are we doing here? So we really kind of started to to delve into okay, well, what do people really need? And you know, advocacy was a big one, and and of course that's, you know, we grew it significantly what our advocacy efforts were, and then that went to a whole other level during COVID. Um, you know, I mean, it's hard to believe it at the beginning of COVID. Did you know that the food industry wasn't even considered an essential service? Like, how crazy is that? <laughs> like, like what's more essential than food? What's right? more essential than eating? Yeah, it wasn't an essential service, and, and I didn't know that. I would just assumed it. I didn't know that at all. That doesn't make any sense at all. Well, we've all learned something today, so that's good. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, I guess there was no real reason. Why would you have to designate an essential service when there's nothing going on? I mean, I mean, we know it's essential to to live, but I guess 
you don't have to designate it as anything until fucking the world's shutting down on us. Yeah, it, it, that, and you're right. Like you know, when things were just kind of chugging along, there wasn't any any reason for it. But I mean, all of a sudden, you know, all the all the all the suppliers of PPE sort of said, "Oh, we we you're not an essential service," and we've been told we can only sell to essential services. So all of a sudden, our our, you know, our phones are ringing off the hook from companies that were like that. So they could you know that that just order PPE on a weekly basis, and all of a sudden they you know the, the all their suppliers pulled the emergency brake on and they couldn't get it, and they were they're all going to shut down because they couldn't even get masks and masks and uh, and gloves and hand sanitizer for their staff like it was nuts so um but but when he first went to government you know they said well you know what i mean what difference is that going to make and i think you know th here's a good example of it and even now if, you know now that COVID is fortunately in the rearview mirror i think we need to really think about the food industry as as a priority and essential all the time like for example like you probably heard you probably both heard this all the time like you can't find warehouse space right now in yeah. any of the urban impossible. areas particularly the lower mainland commercial space is really hard to find yeah impossible. and people who are having their leases coming up for renewal they're finding out their lease rates are doubling from where yeah. they were when they signed three years wow. ago well yeah. but why well i mean like amazon's got how many million you know square feet of, of space that they've been gobbling up throughout the lower mainland like at one point well how do you prioritize food like you can't take away all the places where they can store it and make it and pack exactly. it and distribute it and you can't push it say, oh, well, yeah and then well, well why are why are prices so high what why i don't yeah. understand what's going on it's like well that's not treating it like a priority so i think we need to almost take a more holistic approach to, like if you really want to take this thing seriously and really really call it an essential service like what does that mean and really map out those things but i mean that's kind of that's a really key one like we're hearing all the time from people that are just panicking because they can't find space so we talk about it all the time because i have yeah. i work for two distributors one in the city and one in, in burnaby down where the new amazon is like they need 17 warehouses in the city but down there and you're thinking you know this is great guys you don't have any place for for food really to be yeah. right you keep pushing it out of the city because obviously real estate in vancouver is super expensive better yeah. develop it better to do anything make it new so you can charge 40 bucks a foot triple net right i get all that exactly yeah. but the thing is you know we're we're talking one day and you look at around the world when things go sideways you know if we have an earthquake in the city if you've got mm -hmm. no food distribution in the city and it's on the other side of bridges which may or may not be there or yeah. whatever it is yep. or you start pushing people all the way out to chilliwack you know what our roads are like getting into the city it's oh, it's yeah. really difficult to move around to vancouver toronto you know at least you don't have the mountains and you don't have the earthquake issue but this city is not easy to move in and we no. learned something brutal in in in, in covid we need to protect our food source. Well, we, can't we were rely on everybody. Well, no, I mean, and that's the thing, you know, and, and you know, of course, I've talked about it a lot, but I mean, you know, when you saw empty store shelves, I mean, you know, you'd have to go back to you'd have to go back to the Great Depression when you saw empty like, store shelves. The way they were, right? but, no pasta, no, no cereal, no basics, right? I mean, my God, I think it's just surprising to me. Like, I guess I'm it's a podcast, so, so nobody can see me with the face I've got, but. I just don't, we can't, like, we, we're, we're all anxious to outrun the past, but, like, the pandemic showed us that we didn't do things right. Like, we, we kind of need to fix these things, and now we're in the same spot again, right? Like, Well, we seem to, it's just a different set of issues. Like, the pandemic making it an essential service probably makes sense, because, again, yeah. we know the food's essential, we get all that. But yeah. you don't think of it as essential service until, you know, you're closing down. What right. James is saying is right. Like, I don't know. Toronto, you guys have land. Like, you can move out. We're kind of stuck. We got a border, an ocean, and a mountain yeah. range. Like, there's only so much space we can kind of move yeah. in. And when you start choking the city, like, to, to, you know, if you're looking at literally $40 a foot triple net, which means you could be paying up to $48 a foot. Like, if you need 10,000 square feet of warehouse, it's going to cost you a shit ton of money to rent warehouse. You know, and then you do it like our city infrastructure, like we live in a great city, but it's not easy to move. Like when we lost the Coca-Cola during those, the rain that time and the yeah, and yeah. Abbas, we have four ways into the city and all were blocked. Like yeah. nobody could get in or out of the lower mainland. That's two and a half million people in a five million, uh, five million person province. We're literally cut off. That's insanity. <laughs> Well, it is. And the thing is, most people really thought about the movement of food. But one of the bigger issues that we're dealing with, you know, you're talking about, uh, you know, we're talking about Chilliwack a minute ago. I mean, that I mean that the only flour supplier for all the bakeries in the lower mainland is based in Chilliwack. And, exactly. and they were cut off. They couldn't get in. They couldn't get right. out. All of a sudden, everybody was running out of ingredients. Um, and then staples, course, bread. Think of it. 
Abs- absolutely. So, so that was a huge threat. And then, and then of course, with the backlog of, of trucks, all of a sudden the containers were getting backed up at the ports. And, you know, what, what we learned is, you know, cause I, you know, I was spending a lot of time on the phone with, you know, the ministry of transportation and the port authority and, you know, same thing there's, but they don't have a system to delineate what's perishable and what's not perishable in no. the ports. So, you know, you could have a, a, you know, you could have a pallet full of bolts or a pallet full of perishable, you know, some sort of a perishable product that's an ingredient for somebody and they have no way of knowing. No, and, you got the bananas rotting on the port and the bolts are fine. And they were the first guys out. You think about the and they're the first guys it. out because they have no system for it. So same thing, you know, it goes back to, okay, well, if we're actually going to call this an essential service, like what needs to change? Right. And, and, and these are, and these things we're talking about are really just sort of symptoms of the root cause. It's like, well, right. we, we actually need to be sort of prioritizing it. And that means sometimes making some tough decisions about, you know, well, you know, and, 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 you know, and we, I don't think it's fair to expect private industry to sacrifice like for example you know if amazon comes on and offers you a couple of dollars more a square foot than a small processor you can't but then is there something else we can do if you're gonna right. uh, can you can you can you create some sort of tax incentives or some sort of uh, uh incentivize people to be able to kind of prioritize food like but you know you have to actually step back and look at it in a way you can't just expect people to make a bunch of sacrifices i mean hopefully to a certain degree you can but um you know there's there's only so far you can take that but uh, you know i think we have to almost look at it at the system level and and break it down and look at all the number of different things we can do to treat it differently so i think that's sometimes where i i, I, mm-hmm. I like it's since we've been podcasting especially we've been involved much more in your organization and much more in chfa so you start to learn what the organizations can do and the challenge i think we have in a lot of these situations is there's no voice like there's not a there's like small business is the backbone of the country small business is not having a voice Big corporate does, government does, small business doesn't. Food processors have no voice per se. Thank God they have you guys. But you know what I mean? It's really tough to 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 get onto, let's say, it, it's not sexy TV, it's not sexy news. It doesn't get the the sort of respect or airtime that it probably deserves. You know, and it's trying to change that. Like we need to get out there and really tell people the problems we're having. And there are fixes. And how do we go about this? And it's not even four hundred dollars to everybody to go buy groceries or some <laughs> bullshit thing that we just did, right? Yeah. You know, it's not yeah. about running the printing press and just we just willy nilly throw money around. That's not where we're, nobody's asking for that. It's, no, you got, no. You know, I don't know. I don't know what the solutions are, but it's getting very frustrating because you can you can still see that it's really it's broken. But we we need like it's almost like. Um we need a different way, you know, cause maybe part of the issue is we've just been so blessed for so long to have really, really great conditions, right? Like if you think of across the country pre pandemic. Yeah, no big deal. Like 08, 09, yes. And then, but then there's, there's 10 years of just really great growth, right? And so we're just not like, even now you look at it and you go, look, there's forest fires in BC, there's forest fires in, in Ontario, Quebec, like, but based on kind of these definitions, we, we haven't really cleaned up our act to be able to go, guys, it's an emergency. Here's how we do things different, right? Like yeah. pandemic should have said to us, guys, <clears throat> we've never trained. We, we're we not one of those countries that have had a lot of adversity. So we haven't, I, I say that with all due respect, I get different regions of the country have had for the I most part, like, you know, there's no pre- wars, there's no civil unrest, correct, there's correct, no conflicts. Right? So, but maybe I mean, now what we really need to do is sit down and go, what does this really mean? If it's an essential service, if it's essential, then maybe all of our infrastructure needs to be rethunk, right? In terms of like, hey, you know what? I need to be able to find the food. Like if I, yeah. if I have a hundred rail cars, how do I figure out which one has the food right. on it? So I can get yeah. the damn food off, right? Like yeah. everything else can stay, right? Like how do I do that, right? I don't know. Yeah. And it's a long list of stuff that can be looked at. Right. And, yeah. and, and it's also, you know, the thing is, I mean, it's not, it's not unique to the food industry and it's not unique to BC, just kind of like some of the labor challenges that we've been mm-hmm. facing. But at the same mm-hmm. time, what makes the, what makes the food industry unique is it is that essential service. Like to me, I think, I think that's that key differentiator where I think it, it warrants look at like, you know, kind of peeling that onion and looking at all those different layers and figuring out like, how do we actually do this? You can't just say, sorry, there's no more space or you have to pay, more than you're able to pass on. So now you just have to sacrifice margin just to be able to kind of keep making food because people are going to eventually, and we hear it now, or they're just making that decision, right? It's like, this isn't worth it anymore. I can't make money 
Um, we have so many members that have actually given up their sort of day job to start this and pursue their passion. And then, you know, you do it for three years and it's like, well, okay, but I, I'm, I'm not even collecting a paycheck yet. Like, how am I yeah. supposed to get over that hump to get there? And, you know, we want to be able to foster and support those so they can continue and grow. But mm -hmm. if they keep hitting the same wall, I mean, it's, you know, sooner or later your patience is going to run out or your money will, right? So well, typically it's the money and then these call it a day, right? Yeah, of course. Of course. Yeah. And that's, and that's where we're worried. Like we were, you know, had a couple of meetings the other day and we were, you know, talking to some people and they said, geez, like we're terrified if our, you know, our lease rates are coming up in a year and a half. And, you know, are, you know, we keep hearing, we're hearing rumblings that they're going to be 40% higher because they're going to want to actually price this out so they can bring in somebody bigger who's willing mm -hmm. to pay more. So mm -hmm. it's like, geez, if people are thinking that now, then yeah, we, and we don't want to wait for a bunch of businesses to like on, on average, the number of businesses um, in, in BC in the food space has actually continued to grow. But I mean, you know, this keeps going and, and we're going to see an opposite trend. And that'll that'll be a little scary because I've been in this role for nine years and I haven't really looked at that macro data until I started this job. Right. But I it, it's gone up literally every single year for the last nine years. So if this starts to decline. I think it's going to be quite a quite a, a, a bit of a, a bad indicator for, for the long term. So but you're so a lot of your sit downs then I'm assuming are, are at a government level. So talking to municipalities, talking to the the provincial government, I'm I'm assuming some degree federal government, maybe via the provincial. But so what are you finding though? Like are 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 without you know I'm not asking to slam anybody, but are are do our politicians get it? Like or is it, yeah. does it you know does it matter until the votes matter? Like does anybody actually pay attention to this? Yeah, I mean <clears throat> that's a great question, but it's a complicated one, Kenny. I would say. Um, some of them get it, um, but it's just it's just way more complicated than any one of them. And just because of the size of the industry, like we, you know, we typically, you know, we, like on paper, we fall under the Ministry of Agriculture, but so much of the stuff that affects us goes way beyond the purview sure. of the Ministry of Agriculture. For so, sure. so, you know, when it first started, I had, you know, good relationship with the Ministry of Agriculture. Now I've kind of evolved that and starting to work with different ministries. I, and, and I am involved federally because I'm also, I'm, a, I'm vice chair of Food and Beverage Canada, which is a national advocacy group. So I, I certainly have a lot of involvement on the national level. Okay. And that's, that's important too, because you think of some of the major policy things that impact industry, they're usually happening in Ottawa, not Victoria, For sure. from, from mm -hmm. a policy perspective. So being plugged in and being able to communicate that to our members is really key. Uh, and also just advocacy is an interesting animal in BC. Um, you know, you sort of raise the, raise the flag on something that could be happening down the road, just the average size of business could just cause the average size of, of company is so small here, they'll generally kind of like, you know, they end up having to operate from here just cause they're wearing so many hats and they're working yeah. long days. So they don't really understand sometimes some of the, the potential downstream impacts of these policy changes until it's already hitting them. And of course you can't advocate after it's already happened. That's mm -hmm. that ship was kind of sailed by that, yeah, that yeah. Type of thing. Right. So trying to communicate and kind of engage industry on those kinds of things can be a bit challenging in BC, but you know, it, it's, it's really important. Um, and I'd say, you know, the, min the ministry of agriculture in BC has actually been um, quite strong. They've been pretty, um, you know, they've been pretty, uh, they've been pretty, they've been very supportive. Um, and they're always sort of keep the channels open, which is good, but you know, they're, the problem is they're, they're going to be limited within their power to really affect meaningful change. So, right. um, yeah, so it, it, it can get frustrating at times. I mean, my first few years, I would say advocacy used to be about 15 to 20% of my job. And then I think during COVID it was about 95% of my yeah. job and it's probably leveled off somewhere in the middle. I'd say it's probably more like about 30 or 40%, but I mean, those are important conversations and we see ourselves as that conduit. Uh, to make sure that that government does understand what some of those challenges are and certainly even with things like the, the retail code of conduct and some of those practices like we've been you know regularly communicating to them about some of the challenges that our members are facing in that arena so it's uh, um, those are important relationships to have but they've got to be collaborative for sure Can, for sure oh did we lose them I think we just lost them again I think I think we should get him to just back up a second and talk about the membership um i'd like to otherwise we could talk about yeah. the government thing forever because I, I think i think what he's doing is really cool we but i <laughs> it occurred to me that we we skipped that part a little bit i know well because it's that was um, where the questions go but because i you know once until he gets back on it's not ministry of agriculture and ministry of labor ministry of transportation like there's so many things so it's a big big that's another podcast oh unless we can't yeah. get james back and then it doesn't really matter yeah 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 but yeah i just i don't know it just i yeah I don't know how these groups um, do it. You know, no, it's, I really just, don't. I, it's a lot of things, right? And I think like, I just think, you know, you, you have a membership base. I mean, um, these guys, um, 
CHFA, you have a membership base that's so broad and you've got it's small like, to large food manufacturers, you've got, you've got brands, you've got, yeah. you know, uh, folks like us in there, you've got brokers, you get all these folks in there. And then the, you're, you're right. They're, they're like small to big, big to small. They're all over the place, right? Like, so how do you, like, how do you, how do you even know what government groups you got to be in and all of those things? Hey, um, we went while you were gone. Um, we changed the Sorry. entire set of topics and we're, we're on it. No, I'm just joking. We've already moved um, on. <laughs> but, but we realized that we, we went probably one step too far because um, what might be good is for you just to cover what BC Food and Bev does, um, you know, and, and what your membership sort of kind of looks like. Because I think that'll fill in some gaps. It'll on, fill something else. Because otherwise, yeah. honestly, we could probably do an we, hour. Yeah, literally, we could do a podcast on how to deal with government yeah. and, and and the challenges we should all have and how we should push our MLAs yeah. and et cetera, et cetera, yeah, et cetera. Yeah. So yeah. that might be podcast yeah. number two. Sure. So well, sure, we can back up a little bit. So yeah. So I mean, we're a, we're a nonprofit, but we're an industry association, and we kind of represent the full gambit. Like we're the only association that kind of handles micro, micro, small, medium, and large. Uh, anybody who is manufactures in here or at least is based here and sometimes even has production elsewhere, they're, they're members of our association. So our combined membership is about $7 billion um, and their needs are largely different. You know, like, I mean, a larger company, you know, if you've got 400 employees here, you probably don't need help with a lot of the, you know, some of the basic functionality things, right. getting, you know, getting listings, getting distributed, understanding the regulatory environment. They, they'll have they'll have full time staff dedicated to those things. Um, so what we've really tried to do in, as, as we kind of grown and evolved is really kind of diversify and sort of specify what our, our offering is to the, based on the size of business. I mean, smaller businesses need help with so many things. So that, that takes up a good chunk of our time and it represents about 64% of our membership. So most of our members are actually very, very small and they make up the overwhelming majority of the industry in BC. The number of large companies in BC is pretty finite, right? Like right. you don't have a no, nobody, no, no, you know, you don't have any multi-billion dollar companies that just move here and, 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 uh, and station themselves here. So, um, so, but, so what we try to do is kind of really focus on growth So trying to help people grow, whether they're big or small. And, and that becomes a core part of, of it. But, but we really kind of have four main platforms. One of them I, I touched on earlier was about building community. It's about bringing people together, understanding some of those commonalities so we can kind of um, you know, it's easy to sort of diagnose and problem solve with, with shared learning um, and even just events and networking and, and, and connecting. It's so key. I mean, we're not going to have all the answers, but we've also got a huge network. So if we don't have the answers, we can connect you to somebody that does. Yeah, Kenny. Um, and then the other one, Kenny. Sorry, go ahead, Phil. Oh, so, I'm sorry, James. I, I just said we, we, we send everyone to Kenny. That's, that's what we do. <laughs> there you go. Easy. Look at that. Easy. Done. That bow tied itself, didn't it? <laughs> You know, sooner or later is going to come that way. That's fine. Absolutely, yeah. And, and then, uh, and, and then the other one is really growth. I mean, we we do try to f focus and help companies that want to grow. I mean, if you're a startup and you want to sell in farmers markets and you want to just stay there and, and don't have any ambitions of growing beyond that, chances are you won't get a get a lot of value out of membership with us because you won't you won't need us. Although I still always tell people, you know, an association membership is just like a gym membership. You're ultimately going to get out of it what you put into it. Exactly. <laughs> right. And then the other part is around general learning. You know, I mentioned already, you know, we've got a lot of, you know, you know plant-based and, and wineries and, and natural health products and seafood, you know, such a diverse industry here. So we really trying to kind of focus on those common, those, uh, those common things that everybody needs and really sort of, so we kind of call that general knowledge. So as opposed to getting overly specific or overly technical on small topics or specific subcategories, we generally try to kind of provide um, help with, uh, with sort of that broader curriculum. And then the other important one we've just been talking about is also being that voice for industry and, and advocacy is a really important uh, part of what we do. And, and those are kind of our four platforms. And then to do that, you know, one of the, one of the things that I've struggled with is I like to take everything on. And, and of course you're, you're as a nonprofit and a small team, uh, you know, we're, and I always like to say we're small, but mighty. Um, but as we want to take out things and make things bigger and make things better, it's, you know, it, it, it puts strain on the team. So, we, we just kind of did a strategic plan and I just sort of laid out, those are kind of our four pillars that we're kind of building on to really help our members in the best way we can. Um, but, you know, the other thing, it's not really, none of those pillars are very, very strong unless we've got a strong foundation. So a really core part of what's, what's my main responsibility um, is, is to really make sure it's got solid financial footing so that we can actually accelerate and, 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 and move those pillars forward. Because if, if we don't have the resource to actually do any of those things or, or even the people to do that last thing I want to do, I've got a, 
I've got a group of extraordinary people. The last thing I want to do is burn them out or feel like I'm taking them for granted because they can just keep doing more and more and more. Like we have right. to be smarter about that. Um, so we, you know, putting more systems in place, we've evolved a lot. I think we're about triple the size of an association we were when I started. Um, and now we have a team of seven as opposed to a team of two when I started. Um, but we actually want to add a couple more people this year as well. And again, it's just about being able to build, bring, bring, bring new ideas, bring new discipline in. And, and it's always trying to find that way to add value for, for, for members and the stuff that we do well, let's make it better. If the stuff we're doing is not working, let's scrap it. We've never been afraid of, of, of doing that either. And, and just, you know, throwing those things away and focusing on what's going to resonate the most with our members. And, and it's kind of nice because actually when I look at what we do now versus when I started, like we actually there's very few things that are kind of legacy that we've kind of held over the through the last nine years. But I think that's a good thing because it means that we're being responsive to what, what industry is telling us. Hmm. How was that? No, that's really cool. That's like, really I, I think that's, that's kind yeah. of what we needed, right? Because I think that rounds out. You think of yeah. the conversations that you're having now with with government and all the different levels of government, it makes, it makes sense. I think the other thing that um, when you were coming back on, Kenny and I were talking about was just how the heck you go about calibrating who you talk to, how you talk to folks um, for a membership that's so diverse as yours, right? Because you've just got, you, you've got small to big, you've got, you've got um, yeah. food processors, you've got brands, you've got, you know, kind of everything in between as well. Um, how do you, like what, I guess, two parts of that question. One is, how do you do that? And then two, how do you keep a pulse on what your members are worried about? I guess they're, yeah. you know. And again, with a diversity, you could have a whole set of different worries in all these little buckets. You, you can. It's just, and, and you need to really listen and, and understand because sometimes their, their, their issues are very, very specific to whatever kind of product they're making. But a lot of the time, they're still, you know, the things we've talked about already, I can't find space, I can't find a warehouse, mm -hmm. I can't find a distributor, I can't pass on these costs to, you know, through pricing, I've got labor issues, I can't afford equipment, the bank won't give us money, I right. don't understand these regulatory changes, like, so those are really st still fairly universal. Um, but that said, I mean, it's a really good question, Phil. I mean, I, I have to say, I'm, I'm very... Um, you know, Kenny, you asked me earlier about, you know, sort of my interest in the job and, and, and when I first took it. And I'll say that, that my, my, the, the 20 years I spent in the industry before coming into this has been invaluable um, to exactly what you're saying, Phil. Like I've been able to, um, when I talk to people right away, I, you know, it's, I, I think, it, I think early that was important because it also, I think it gave the association credibility if I actually knew what people are talking about and I felt what they felt and I've been where they are. Um, and then also adding Elisa. Um, just in terms of this specific part about, about, you know, talking to, to industry and talking to members, I mean, Elise has an industry background as well. She's also incredibly empathetic. She's a great listener. So, and she gets, you know, she gets calls regularly. We, we get kind of different kinds of calls. I, I tend, it's kind of funny. I can't, everyone sort of, uh, everyone who's known her now in the last few years, she gets a, a, a lot of people who just kind of reach out to her. And then I've got some people that have been members for 10 years and they reach out to me just because that's who they're familiar with. But we're, we're still small and that's actually kind of nice. Like I was, I'm a big believer in putting your best foot forward. So it's like, Hey, if someone in somebody else in the organization has got a good relationship with that member, then they should be reaching out. Um, and then we also, you know, we have, you know, we have weekly meetings and we start talking through those different things. So between the membership team and myself, like, who are we talking to? What are we hearing? What's going on? And um, because we're a small group, it also dr that drives our programming as well. Like if we are going to do a breakfast series topic and we know going to bring in a hundred people to it, well, we don't really have to kind of sit around and daydream about what kind of topics we want to do, because if we're doing our job properly and we're actually getting input from our members and we're starting to hear certain questions being asked on an increased frequency, well, we can help 50 people with that at 50 times, or we can actually create a form to kind of bring all of those people together, kind of do it once. So that also. We lose them always at that at a key point. <laughs> and I just want to hear the rest of that story. He's leaving us hanging. It's it's actually a tactic, I think. I think it's a tactic right. too. I think he's. <laughs> I think it's a tactic too. No, but I, but I like it. I I like I like what they're doing because I think um, you know, they really do right. Like if you think of even the breakfast that um, so so Kenny went for anyone who was there. I mean, you know, Kenny spoke at a breakfast and. Um, what I can tell you is before that breakfast, Kenny spent a lot of time fretting over oh, so the topic and, you know, whether he was you know, kind of going to be on, 
on point for the topic, whether it was too doom and gloom. And but to their credit, in a lot of ways, they asked you as kind of a well placed ask, right? Because they knew that people were worried about, right? Because you've since heard that from a whole bunch of people that we've talked to, where they were like, "Dude, that was right." Uh, nobody. Said it was it, more timely, but, I guess, than yeah. what I, that what the, what even I had anticipated. Yeah. And that's yeah. sort of what I wanted to ask you is because it's, it's kind of I know that there's everybody's got some different problems, and I know there's a lot of similar problems. But out of straight curiosity, like what are I guess I'm, I'm always trying to figure out, like, because they do quite a bit of, they do as a group a lot of breakfast yeah. type things. We just keep talking yeah. through, you don't sweat it. Hey guys, yeah, I, yeah. I don't know what the no, hell. Don't worry about it. It's not the end of the world. No, no. We, we'll have to, we'll we do this again. It. We'll do it in the evening it's run when you're home. It's a very ta clever tactic on your side, is you're right in the middle of an interesting point, and then you drop off, and we're like, damn all it. Right. He's the, left us hanging. And the answer to it all is <laughs> exactly that's what it is. And we're thinking, okay, shit, like really? And it's not once yeah. you've done that, you like three times. It's every time it's on a cliffhanger. Think this is bullshit. I was I just know, thinking, you know what? You, you got me on here for an hour. They're going to figure out I'm just not that bright. So I got to cut myself <laughs> off halfway through. So you think that I have important things to say without well, not helping us them. because then they have to listen to us and they, they know we're not that bright. Uh, so it's not helping anybody. Yeah, that's a good point. So. And all I was trying to say was that you know if we're if we're listening to our if we're listening to our members about the things that are concerning them, we actually use that to create forums to to bring right. everybody together to talk about them rather than kind of dealing with fifty people on the same issue. But that's so all that's all easy to say, and it makes total sense. And you guys say it very easily, but it's still hard to do. I'll tell you is. why. Like I, I give you an example. Like the one I did. My first question to Sumner was, like, who's in the audience? Because it's no use talking about pricing um uh, to a retailer if all you do is process unless you want to make sure that you understand the the mechanics of pricing so you can help whoever you're processing for but typically you know what i mean that's a brand issue so you're trying to you guys you guys your bucket is so freaking diverse yeah you can't, i don't know how you guys manage because we've done two webinars with you guys now and we've done uh the one breakfast thing and it's topics that when I when we when we get asked, I sometimes look at them thinking, if, if if they're all food processor and producers, like what the hell are they going to get out of this? And then you get to the thing, and it's all over the place. There's brands, as processors, as someone. I mean, they're just they're everywhere, and you're thinking, holy shit! Like, how do you manage this? Yeah, it's it's interesting. I mean, that's well, and that's why it, you know that's why it's so important to have such a good team, right? And and we've got so many, and we've got like people who have incredible attention to detail. I mean, people that are incredibly thorough and you got other people who are incredibly passionate. You kind of put all that together and it sort of becomes big, bigger than the sum of the parts. I, I honestly say that's kind yeah. of, that's kind oh, of what yeah. you attribute it to. So, um, yeah. And, and you know, I think, you know, everyone understanding what their role is and, under, and, and I think working collaboratively, I think we're generally a group that, that likes to work together and, you know, and we all, it's not like we all have industry backgrounds. I actually think mm -hmm. in some ways, if we all had 10 years in the food industry, it would probably be, tougher in some ways because i think we'd probably have a harder time with consensus whereas elise and i kind of talk a lot about you know the different topics and stuff and we're generally on the same page or yeah. um so then we kind of talk through sort of the what the what becomes pretty easy because usually elise and i driving it because we we talk and and christine as well who's now talking right. to, to members and they all they all like her better than elise and i anyway so um but you know but between the three of us we kind of start to do here's what here's what we're hearing um, and then that kind of drives the what, and then the rest of the team can kind of pull together the right. how, and 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 that, and it kind of takes off from there. Like I mean, you know, we're talking about breakfast series. I mean, of course, we got food pros a week today, and I mean, that's yep. that's uh, I mean, that's like a breakfast series times a thousand. I mean, there's so many moving parts along with that, and they're they're just working so hard right now to get ready for it. So it's uh, I'm very very proud of the group. I'm very fortunate to have uh, to to work with such a great group of people. No, it's it's like, it's, it's going to be so it's good. Like, yeah. like we we just. Uh, like we've had the privilege of, of kind of having each of these folks on fast thoughts with us and they're just there's some really cool people there's so many cool people yeah. and, then, and then that panel with aaron and um jade and um karen from yeah. bloom is just gonna be like wow. i'm looking forward to it i think it's gonna be i think it's gonna be really cool and i well, do think yeah, uh, well, I was gonna say, and even in a case like like Eve, like uh, like if you've been in the food industry for any period of time, most people have heard Eve Potvin's story. Yeah. And when I first started, it was funny because it was like he'd spoken at a bunch of events, and I was like, okay, well, we can't have Eve come and speak because he's he's spoken at so many things like before I got here. Yeah. Um, right. But it's so interesting. But now the fact that he sold off his you know his second company, he's actually making a go of it again and making like plant based yeah. sushi. 
Right. Uh, oh we said like this is all. So he's a he's a startup again, yeah. but he's got all his wealth of experience. So he's yeah. got a similar message, but now he's got a new vision and a new audience. So it's kind of funny that it's like I'd hate for somebody to look at that and go, "Oh, well, I've heard him speak," because what he'll be actually talking about not on this one, yeah, going to be so different. Like how many how yeah. many entrepreneurs do you know of have actually got it? Like who's been that successful once? But I mean, he's he's making a go of it on the third time try. It's crazy, and it's a good product, by the way. Just to be clear. oh, it's great. Oh, I went like, to the actually, as a matter. Of, well, here's a funny story. I was I was a total peon when I when I went to work for Eve. That was like 1998, and I was a marketing analyst or something. I was like the junior person in the marketing department, and I worked with him, but obviously not that closely because he, you know, we had like senior people that he worked with most of the time. Mm -hmm. And then fast fast forward like 20 years later, I he asked me to introduce him at the press conference when they announced the launch of Conscious. Like I thought like, that was pretty. That was actually pretty cool. It's pretty cool. Yeah, that's pretty cool. That was my is arrival. It, it is he me, bringing it, 30, 30 years in the making, but is he bringing? You almost need to just say, "Listen, you can't speak unless you're gonna bring. <laughs> you're gonna bring some sushi with you, like you just that gotta, would be awesome. You no, know, right? It'd it would be, be awesome. awesome. Yeah, it would be awesome. Yeah, yeah. It was actually funny. I when when we were at the opening, they had all their food out, um, and everybody was trying it and was marveling at it. And and it, yeah, it was it was pretty hilarious because there was a couple of. Uh, couple of ladies there who were pregnant and they hadn't been able to eat sushi for months and it was so funny they're like you know, almost felt guilty eating it but they said like, oh my god i said i said to eve i said there's a whole new marketing category for you you've got you know pregnant women who can't eat sushi there you go there's your there's your new vein to tap into so there's a lot of people out there man yeah and yeah. And, and he and he actually has done a really nice job with it the product's actually it's a good product yeah yeah, and it's it's a good mix. There's a lot of yeah. lot of great speakers, and 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 that's the thing. I like I mean, that. The, and the, and the whole day is really just about bringing people together. It's right. just about that building community that we talked about, and great speakers. And they're going to be sharing their stories and their passion. But you know, it's that passion piece that kind of it doesn't matter who you talk to in the industry. I'd, I've never, I don't think I've ever met anybody, any founder, or any entrepreneur who's worked in the space who's been indifferent about what they do. Right? <laughs> so, no, you're wired for everybody's wired for sound, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that's yeah, great though, because you don't you don't usually get that anywhere else, right? You no. don't get you don't like. I mean, I go, I have lots of friends who, you know, we'll talk about work, but nobody's like, nobody's fired up no. over what they do, no. right? They're no. like, oh, I, I, I sorted papers and I filed reports today and wow, that was stimulating. But uh, yeah, no, it's, 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 that, that's, that's what makes our industry pretty unique, actually. So, and I think that's probably why I, why I fell in love with it. So that's why we never leave. That is why we never leave. That's right. Right. It seems to just keep pulling you back in, right? It's just yeah. one of those things. Oh, I couldn't cool. imagine. I couldn't imagine what else I would do. Like if I nah. wasn't doing this or if I wasn't working in the food industry, I just, I just don't because my whole life, like, even, and of course, of course, all the relationships I've built over, yeah. over the years, I'm, you know, friends with people that have been in the industry for 25 years as well. And it's, it's, uh, yeah, it's wonderful. I wouldn't change it. I love it. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. Despite all the things we complained about in the first 20 years. You know what? But, but that's, you know what? But that's part of life too. And you know what? Sometimes you complain, you complain, but you a lot of times you're rehashing because you, you're always thinking. So you bring oh, up yeah. a bunch of negatives and you think, okay, how do we get through them? How do we get through them? Or get, how do we get around yeah. them or go over or go under? Like there's always got to be a way to, to, you know, put a roadblock up. There's always a way around it. And that's half the fun of the game is trying to figure out how to move through. It is. And I used to love, I used to talk about how, how one of the things I love most about the industry is how resilient it is. And then resilient became the most overused word in exactly. the world for three years. So I, I try not to use it anymore, but so if you come up with a better word than resilient, that means the same thing that, then let me know, but I, yeah, I, I keep, we'll running, I keep it. wanting to st say it and then I have to keep pulling back. So I think, you know, the only other word that comes to mind is persistent because yeah. I think, I, I think people in this industry, yeah, they we're, just don't get up. We're wired to go. We're wired to recognize when we fail and then we're wired to recognize, no, no, that wasn't the final go. Like I screwed it up, but I, I know exactly what I did wrong and I'm going <laughs> to, <laughs> and you just keep plugging right we we all do it and yeah at some point you go you idiot right you gotta but we don't right we just kind of no, get right back up again and you go, no no i i figured out what i i'll get it this plugging. time it's all good we we got it right so yeah no exactly yeah okay my friend if your time is done i was I'm, i we got we could have you back on for sure we could have you and lisa on i'd love to talk more about the government stuff because i mm -hmm. do think it's i i don't think i, I again it, None of this sexy talk gets onto the news or onto that side. So I don't people really understand as much um, as they should or could. And our listeners are all CPG and, and your community as well. So it's always trying to find stuff that they could actually take away and, and do something with it. Right. Oh, yeah, and joining sure. these organizations is, is important. So if you are in BC and you're a brand and or a food processor, manufacturer, co-packer, 
you really should take a look at BC Food and Bev. Yeah. There's your plug. Yeah. Cool. There's your plug. <laughs> Give me a call. And you got a few people you can pick from. You don't have to stalk. If you don't like James, you can phone Elise. If you don't like her, phone Sumner. You got Christine. There's someone will talk to you. You you don't have to search very far to find somebody who'll probably someone like more than me. You. So there you go. There you go. Or somebody smarter than me either. So. <laughs> That's funny. If people um, want to get a hold of you yeah. or BC Food and Bev, like does you specifically BC Food and Bev as well? How do they do it? What's the best way to? Yeah, you know, to if you go to our website. Yeah, if you go to our website, you've got all of our pictures and all of our alter egos as um, Muppet characters. If you, I've seen that. I love it. I love it. I we lost are... in the game. It's always on the cliffhangers. I, I think those are hilarious. But yeah, you you can go to. Um, I'll fill that in for him. But you can go to BC Food and Bev. Um, it's literally bcfb.ca. So B C is in Charles, F is in food, B is in beverage.ca um, to uh, to go to BCFB, and then uh, that's where you find them. And then and then James um, Donaldson. It's easy on on LinkedIn. LinkedIn. It's easy to find. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's so we'll right. All the we links talked. in the we'll put all the links in there and everything like that. But uh, um james is gone but we'll uh, he's there somewhere but he probably can't hear us but thank you james for coming on um this I, is and i think we will have him back on we'll do yeah i think I, I was gonna say to him i think we'll shoot him a note after this and i think um like it, well as we head into the fall for example um what people need to be thinking about um you know when they you know, when they kind of ramp up for the fall, when we come back from the summer, I think would be a really good time to have them back on. So yeah, no, I totally agree. Yeah. Yeah. Totally okay. agree. Okay. Young man, you can say goodbye because we're going into another podcast. Yeah. Close was, it up for you. Uh, yeah, I know. I was like, I'm not sure if they're done with me or not. So anyway, no, that's okay. We, no, we've we, filled we in all the blanks for you. We'll, we've got all the links below. Website will go on with they yeah. tell you can find you on LinkedIn. They can always phone BC food and Bev, but important yeah. to join these organizations. If you're in the industry, great place for resources, great place to talk to people yeah. and learn before potentially you fall. We were thinking that um, what it might be, really great for um you or you and elisa to come back on um just just as we kind of ramp up for september um you know as you as we kind of hit that last quarter of the year like you're we're going to roll into the summer people are going to start taking breathers and things like that yeah. but you know september is when the tempo picks up and it doesn't let go until christmas right so um it might be a really good time for you guys to come on and and kind of you know, hit the highlights on, on what's happening and things you're worried about or, or things that are happening in, in government that we should be thinking about or looking yeah. at. Yeah. Yeah. No, absolutely. Okay. Love it. Lo love to do okay. that. Yeah. And happy, awesome. we'd be happy to come on together. Okay. Anyway, thanks so much. Thanks so much. I know you got to, you got to bounce yeah. but Kenny and Phil, we'll see you so next Thursday. Yeah. Thanks so much. Yes. Yeah. See you next Thursday. I look forward to it. Sounds good. Okay. Take care, bud. Bye James. All right. Bye. Ciao.